Hello everyone, it's nice to see some familiar faces here and for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is, uh, as Rachel said, Andy Solomon and I'm the founder of, of Yomdal. Um, they always say that you shouldn't really just sort of sit around endlessly and it's very good to get up and stretch your legs a little bit. So if you don't mind, I would just like, before we start, just ask you all just to get onto your, get your feet. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's, let's just give it a quick go. Um, and if you could just dig into your pocket or your bag, I know you've been told to turn it off, but just take out your phone if you'd be so kind. Um, and just hold it for a second. Don't do it. Don't turn it on. Just have a look at it, and just think back to when you acquired this device. How long ago it was? If you got your phone in the last six months, you're very, very lucky. You can sit down, please. It's quite interesting. There's about half the room. Um, if you got your phone in the last year, could you sit down, please? And shall we push it to two years? Sit down, please. And, oh, I'm so sorry, we're left with three people. Please, please sit down. It wasn't, the, the point there is not to embarrass anyone about feeling you've got an old-fashioned device, but your devices at the end there are only just over two years old or less than three years old. That is a very, very, very short time. And the point of that little exercise is just to try to place a thought in your minds about how fast the process of technological change is going. It's accelerating all of the time. Two years now in, in, the, in the world of a piece of technology is an eternity. And with every, every change and every adaptation, every improvement, every new version, the technology enables new behaviors and starts to inform new behavior. And so that's really what I would like to um, explore. I've got a clicker somewhere. Um, we're coming up also to a, um, a very uh, special date for, for, for me and for everyone at Yomdal, um, and, um, which is at the beginning of June 2014 was when we launched our first service into the property sector. Now, at that time, estate agents in the UK um, typically did not use live chat. Uh, most of them would be open during the standard business hours. They would close at whatever time, whether it was 5.30 or whether they had extended hours for some of them. Um, and then they would go away overnight, over the weekend, over holidays. And they'd come back and they'd hope the next morning there'd be a stack of leads that may have come from Rightmove or Zoopla. And they would start digging through them. So in early 2014, we launched um, the first service for estate agents, which gave them the opportunity to be open for 24 hours a day because their recognition is that these days the footfall on the high street, the footfall into your branches is, if it, hasn't, if it isn't rapidly decreasing, it has decreased. People are not stepping in off the threshold on a whim. People are stepping across the threshold after they have completed their research, after they have decided that's the estate agent I want to speak to, if indeed that's the way they want to do it. In fact, most people will want to do it online. Now, when we started in 2014, that first month, we had uh, three clients. Um, small local agencies um, who trusted us to say, you know what, this is worth a go. And those three small agencies are still with us today. Uh, two of them not as small as they were. One of them has been acquired by um, Countrywide, in fact. And, uh, but these days we're now working with, uh, if we measure it by branch, about 2,000 estate agents across the UK. Um, we are managing on behalf of those estate agents in the region of 35,000 chats a month. Most of my stats say 30,000 when we totted up is actually a bit, bit higher than that. So it's 35,000 people a month are engaging via Yondor with our estate agency clients. Um, that in turn gives us a really, really good insight into people's behavior, how they prefer to do things, um, and what they want to get out of an estate agent, you know, what questions they are going to ask. So uh, Alice Thank you very much for that presentation um, about the marketing because these days, thinking like an estate agent, you'd be thinking about traditional high street agents, maybe thinking about purple bricks, right? But actually, that's not, that's not the thing to think about because your customers are not thinking like that. Your customers are thinking like people who don't really know what to do. I was speaking to Mark Hayward from the National Association of Estate Agents um, a couple of weeks ago, and he said that their latest data suggested that people only move house once every 17 years. The orthodoxy used to be seven or eight years or something like that. So I think Zoopla has a higher figure than that, over 20 years. Now, once every 17 years means that the people, your customers, if you're estate agents, not all of you in this room are, but if you're estate agents, your customers are actually incredibly inexperienced in the process 
of buying or selling property. They may not even know what questions to ask, let alone know the process or understand what, 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 um, what they need to do and when. We see a lot of people coming onto um, our service on our various clients, and they will be um, buyers thinking about their new dream home, and they will be um, thinking that's the first thing they should be doing. Well, they're missing the point, of course, because they can find their dream home, but if they're not in a position to proceed, if their house is not on the market, they can't be helped, because no vendor is going to wait until they're ready to actually sell the house. It doesn't work that way. There's a real gulf in education. So as estate agents, thinking like the customer is really, really important. Now, just to take what Alice was saying a bit earlier, with everyone being online, and um, there is a piece of research, Think With Google did in 2016, I think it was, um, but it actually looked at the car buying journey, and it followed a woman called Stacy over a three-month period from the time where she decided she was going to buy a car to the point where she received the keys. And of course, property, you receive a set of keys at the end, that's the final transaction. And in that time, those three months, she was, it, uh, it was calculated that she had 900 digital interactions. That's a lot, right? It's really, really a lot. Now, some of those are, you know, they're not things that anyone can influence, but she's out there, she's doing her research. She's looking at videos, she's doing, she's looking at reviews, she's just, just browsing around, engaging on social media, looking for advice, looking for referrals, looking for all kinds of things, reviews, all this kind of stuff. And for any business wanting to have Stacey's as a customer, if they're not in the places, some of those places, some of those 900 interactions that she's having at the same time in a position to put the brand in front in the way Alice talked about, say for example, with remarketing, having that brand there in front helps keep it front of mind because if you're not front of mind, you're not in the mind. You're not gonna be considered. At the end of Stacey's journey, she narrowed it down to something like 14 models, six dealerships, and she only, she only, made, only actually visited two, I believe. I might be wrong on that, but it was, it was something like that. So those two dealerships where she walked across the threshold, if they had not been influencing her behavior and influencing her thought process along that journey, they're not going to win her business. So to reflect on what Alice said about the importance of driving people in, the importance of keeping your brand front and foremost in your most, ex your most important office, which is your website and your other digital assets, your social media, is really, really important. So now, um, to follow on from where Alice left off, live chat on you move. We started working on you move in 2014, a little bit after Fountain, but not that long after. Um, and we went, we did some lot of pilots and tests with some of the individual franchisees, parts of the website. And then in, uh, this is the date that we went live across the entire website, which says um, the 2nd of February, I think I can't quite read that, um, 2015. And it's like turning on a tap. That was the conversion rate in the red line before chat, and the green line is the conversion rate once chat was in place from day one. And of course, there's a gradual improvement going on there. And of course, Fountain were doing all their magic and helping drive the right traffic through, because if you've got the right traffic coming in, you can convert it into the right people. So if we, if we know we've got lots of vendors coming in based on the campaigns that um, the Fountain are running, then we will convert more of those vendors. And the growth, as you all know, for you move was was, was quite, 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 quite exceptional to the point where they were acquired by Property Franchise Group in September 2016 and have continued their growth on now to well over 100, I think 120 uh, franchisees. So sitting on a gold mine, maybe, but if you've got the traffic, you're driving the right traffic in, if you need to convert more people, you need to think about who your customer is and what they need. So just to put that into sort of stark reality, uh, just taking a random kind of conversion rate. But if you said for every 5,000 unique web users monthly, you had a 2% conversion rate, which would generate for you 100 leads, right? Quite simple. If you move that to a 3% conversion rate, which is a 50% increase in your conversion online, that of course generates you 150 leads. Wonderful. 600 leads a year, okay? Now, if you think about some standard kind of estate agency metrics, and you take, say, for a every 100 valuations that you are able to do, and you win, say, an average of 40 instructions, which I think is probably pretty fair, um, and then of those 40 instructions that go onto the market, 60% of those sell. That means 24 sales based on your 100 market appraisals. 
You move that to 150, of course, that goes up to 60, goes up to 36. Um, an extra 12 sales for every 5,000 website users. Sorry, for every, every 50 um, uh, market appraisals. So that will generate an average fee of 3,000. Obviously, some of you will have probably much higher fees than that, but uh, say, say an average fee of 3,000 uh, pounds will generate an extra 36,000 pounds of commission. How do you find these people? Where is your customer? Now, we all just stood up just now. Well, you, I was already standing up. You stood up afterwards. Um, and you took out your phones. And you are all the customer. Your customer is everywhere all of the time, being a customer. They are always connected. These um, devices, I where I put my phone. There it is. These devices are a great democratizer and a great enabler. People are able, they're at Old Trafford, these poor souls, so it's probably quite a boring game. They're probably all looking for an estate agent, as you'd expect. Um, they can be doing that because they're connected, because they're, the mobile experience is now good enough. Um, they say that you know any website these days should not be built to also work on mobile, but should be built for mobile first, because maybe 60 to 70 percent of your website visitors will be coming on mobile. On the social channels, probably much higher than that. So if you think that every speck of light re represents an always connected potential customer, you have to find ways to be available to them at a time that suits them, not at a time that suits you. They're not always going to be doing it when it's convenient for you. You've got your opening hours. No way on earth could you possibly be open 24 hours a day trying, just waiting for someone to want to make contact with you. But your customers want to do it when it suits them. They will do it when it suits them. If they find a way to have con a, a connection with you, they find a way to ask their question or find out what question they need to ask because for the first time in 17 years they're thinking of selling a house, then you need to be open and ready for them. So our stats say of those 35,000 chats that we handle a month on average, 52% of them are coming outside of standard business hours. Now your Google Analytics tells you this, you know, you know this, of course you know this. But you have to think about it as every single one of those people is another opportunity that you would be ordinarily have your doors open. Think about it in terms of a shop. Um, you walk into a shop and the shop assistant says to you in an old fashioned kind of nice shop, can I help you? And you say, no thanks, fine. And you walk on in and you then say, oh actually, where are the jackets? You turn around, you look for the person who's just said hello to you, say, excuse me, yeah, actually, where are they? They're over there. And off you go, and they come with you, and they help the fit, and ultimately you buy a jacket off them. Now, think about that in terms of going onto a typical traditional website in the middle of the night. You may as well be going into a shop with all the lights off in many cases, because unless you know how things are laid out, unless you know exactly what you want, you may not find it, and as a result, you're not going to hang around. So if you can help people, to guide people, then you are more likely to win their trust and to win their business. Now, there is another thing here. <coughs> Sorry, just excuse me a second. I apologize about this. No. There we go. Stop that. Hmm. Anyone any idea how long that was? Not to hazard a guess. Five seconds. Five seconds? Gosh, that's a quick five seconds. Oh, yeah, okay, Fifth here, 15 over there. Anyone else want to guess? 30. 30 seconds. Anyone else? 10. Okay, so that's interesting. So we've got a range of between five seconds and 30 seconds. Um, it was actually 15 seconds. But it was a bit uncomfortable, wasn't it? It's uncomfortable for me, I know that, because <laughs> I'm standing in front of all you lot, you know. Um, but it was very uncomfortable, and the reason it was uncomfortable is because you were kind of you weren't quite sure what was happening. You quite, weren't quite sure what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing either. Um, but online, if you think someone's online, the first their website, their page, their their their, 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 their whatever they're looking at needs to be loading really super 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 fast. But if they're engaging with someone via live chat, and they've got the chat window on their phone, and they're looking at it and nothing's happening, 15 seconds is about the limit of someone's full attention. 
it starts to wane very quickly after that. You get to 30 seconds, it starts to feel like a really long time. Anything longer than 30 seconds starts to feel like paint drying when you're looking at it. So that 15 seconds, with people being distracted all of the time, they need speed. They've got things going ping and pong and their phone, they've got Twitter and Facebook and all these different things happening all at the same time, all these things competing for their attention. And what's more, they are impatient and they want to move on and they want to get things now very, very quickly. It is that 15 seconds that is actually really, really, really important. So 15 seconds also just happens to be uh-huh, um, so it's a setup really. Um, the average initial response time that Yondel has for all of its live chat engagements, 24 hours a day. Um, and what's particularly interesting about this is um, that as of the middle of last year, we had an average speed to answer of 30 seconds, which was already globally leading. Um, if you look at the stats in the real estate sector globally for live chat response times, you're actually closer to a minute overall um, as the initial response. Now, if that was 15 seconds felt like a long time, imagine what a minute feels like if you don't get any response. How many people are going to give up in that time? So we looked at moving our 15 second response time down to, sorry, 30 second response time down to 15 seconds. And we were already delivering, again, globally leading customer satisfaction scores about 93 to 95%, very, very high. The average in real estate for live chat globally is 73% customer satisfaction. We were overachieving on that front. But interestingly, after we moved it down to this 15 seconds, the customer satisfaction score over the, across the board moved up from 93 to 95% to 98 to 100%. Now that sounds almost impossible, but when we looked into it more deeply, what it's actually saying to us is that people value speed of response immensely. And if you're not getting to them quickly, you may know what the experience is like on a telephone when you call up and you're put on hold for ages some terrible music or whatever, it's just an interminable, and it's an awful experience. But in chat, people are using chat because they want to have an immediate response. They want to know straight away what the answer to their question can be. They need that help. And if they don't get it, they're going to go. Now, of course, when your people are choosing an estate agent, there are still some old fashioned values that are there. You know, there's the rational and the emotional decision. There's the, the rational is, I want a really good estate agent for, with a, a, a really good price, going to do a really good job um, and get me what I want. The emotional says, you're selling my home, it's got all my memories, all the history of my family, my children grew up here, um, and I want to make sure it's passed on into safe hands, and the next people who live here are going to love and cherish it as much as I have done over the time. So then we start thinking about the customer experience and the customer, the customer journey, and how can you help people be um, uh, uh, fall in love with what it is that you've got to offer. It's a tough market out there. Um, because we're dealing with so many estate agents, we hear lots of stories about how their businesses are performing. And we know that this year, some of them are facing a real squeeze. Their cash flow is tight. The property's not moving as fast as they need it to. But in order to help push up these conversion rates and things, it's not all just about technology, being really, really super smart with tech and chatbots and AI and all this kind of stuff. People are social and they enjoy and they cherish human interaction. They want to speak to a person. They want a person to help them. They want a person to show empathy and to then be able to give them that quick information as and when they need it. And this is a great opportunity for you in your businesses, which whatever your business is, estate agent or any, any other kind of business, to set yourselves apart from your competitors by providing that exceptional customer service by recognizing that some people want to be helped. Um, and in fact, I should just say the, the, the U-Move conversion data, going all the way back to the beginning, so think, think about percentages. It's marginal gains here to give big results. Um, so the U-Move percentages, so that 50% uplift in conversion on the U-Move website was achieved from engaging with less than 3% of the users on the website. So the, uh, the, for every 100 people, 97 people continue to do whatever they were doing previously, which may be nothing at all, um, or converting via other channels, and 3% were choosing to go into chat. And of those, a third of those were converting. People like people. They want to be taken, uh, paid attention to, um, and this is a great opportunity for any business to be able to win the heart of someone, because if you think back to the emotional decision, that's saying, I like you, I want to find a way to be able to give you my business. 
you just need to convince me a little bit more. You might be more expensive, but I'm prepared to do that because I like you. So creating that, that, that connection with people. So when we're looking at um, a website, looking at our estate agency clients, um, it's not just a simple pop-up chat. Want to chat? Yeah, all right. No, it's not that at all. It's actually about intelligently trying to identify who the people are, who the people are coming across the website. The system is tracking where they're coming in from. So we can track where they're coming in from um, various campaigns. We can see the acquisition channel they're coming from. If we know the acquisition channel, we might know what they've interacted with. Um, so they might be showing their hand in terms of being a vendor or whatever other profile they, they, they are. Once we're able to track them and identify, you know, so for example, another example would be uh, landlords. Uh, we know most landlords only have one or two properties. A standard kind of um, behavior would be landlords will come in, they'll go to the landlord information pages on the, on the website. Um, and then actually, rather than going into the rental listings, which you kind of imagine that's what they do, they don't. They, they lot them go into the sales listings. And they'll go and look at property prices in their area. And because they've been on the landlord page and then they go into the sales listings, they've shown their hand as a, as a potential landlord and they can be targeted as a landlord. Once we've identified and prioritized in the system who the people are, we can then target them with proactive invitations. And the invitations are one invitation per visit. You don't want to bombard them and annoy them and irritate them. Um, but these invitations are designed to be a direct call to action. Um, you know, uh, you know uh, if you're thinking of selling or letting a property, I could offer a free valuation. Is so much more effective than how can I help you? The, you might feel by saying, how can I help you, is a softer kind of non-salesy kind of thing. But actually, what people are looking for when they're coming into chat is they're looking for an answer to a question. Or they're looking for an opportunity to do something. They want to be around the bush. They just want to know. If you, ask, if you put the onus on them, what do they want to know? They don't know, necessarily. But you say to them, is this what you want to know? Because you've tracked them and identified them. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, it is. I would like to know that. Through then a human engagement, very carefully structured, we're able then to nurture that relationship, um, to build trust, uh, and ultimately to convert them into a, into a prime opportunity. And those, those conversations last typically about 13 minutes for a lead. That's a long time in the web world where you're measuring website visits in, in one or two minutes. And from that, you end up with potentially a motivated customer. They've given a lot of information about themselves, a lot of anecdotal information. For the sales guy picking up the phone to call this person afterwards, there's so much stuff in there. Please don't call before 4 o'clock because I've got to take little Johnny to the doctor. So you call up, how is little Johnny? You wouldn't know that from a web form or an instant online valuation form. These little insights are really, really powerful in terms of being able to help nurture that relationship further. This is kind of stating the obvious, and I would put something like this up because I'm completely biased, obviously, but um, people do like live chat. I mean, I, I could ask in this room how many of you have used live chat these days. I would expect probably all hands to go. Should we do it? How many of you have used live chat in the last month? That's a large number. Okay. How many of you offer 24-7 live chat support on your websites? <laughs> Yomdal, yeah. <laughs> so apart from Yomdal, there is an enormous disconnect there. You're all using it as a channel, and you've all got your reasons as to why you may use it as a channel, but I'd venture you think, I can't be bothered to make a phone call, I can get a quick answer, I can do other things in between if I need to, all kinds of different, I can do it at work and look really busy. There's all kinds of reasons why you might use live chat, but most of you use it, yet most of your businesses don't offer it. It's not connecting. The customer experience, even your own experience is saying, you need to have this. Indeed, 41%, according to this, these stats, um, will say that people prefer to use live chat over any other channel. And it's important to say, live chat is only one of a number of options. The more channels you present to people, the more opportunity you give to people to make contact with you, the more likely they are, of course. But, given the option, 41% of people will say they'd like to use live chat. Telephone still features, email still features, actually social media is probably a little bit low. But the customer satisfaction element is not to be ignored. It's really powerful. Now, let's just think a little bit more about who's doing this stuff. So again, the orthodoxy would be, it's the millennials, it's the youngsters, the digital natives. They, they are the ones who are going to use these channels. Well, I'm going to make an argument now and say, no, it's not necessarily just them. So this is uh, the next three slides are looking at the age group 55 to 75. Um, unfortunately, um, I fall into that age group now. But anyway, and I do have a smartphone. So this is, this is June last, almost a year old, Deloitte, this, this data. So these, that bit dark blue 
thing in the middle will be much taller now, um, based on um, an annual growth rate of 20, about 22, 23% in smartphone ownership of the 55 to 75 year old age group. Okay? So that means that 73% as of the middle of 2017 had a smartphone, and probably everyone in this room does as well. What are they using their smartphones for? You might not be able to read all of this. It's all quite, quite small. Um, but there's a, really in, a couple of really interesting things that come out of this. The first, which I want to point out, is that, and that's uh, top two lines, which are text messaging and voice calls. Um, in the previous week, only 73% of people aged 55 to 75 use their smartphone as a telephone. All right? Um, a few more of them use it as text messaging, just under 80%. But there was a, there's a decrease in text messaging and telephone usage among that age group with their telephones. Which, of course, maybe just aren't telephones anymore. But what's really interesting, the lighter blue lines are the ones you need to be looking at because they're 2017. But what's really interesting is things like this. which says instant messaging in those five years. Uh, so you've got 35% of those, those people in that age group had, had instant messaged on their mobile phone in the previous week. Other things in their emails, social networking, uh, reading news. Um, so they are using these devices in ways to communicate that they would never have communicated as, a, as this particular age group before. They're not just picking up the phone anymore. And then when you put that into some broader kind of context, this age group, 55 to 75, is about 14 million people. The baby boomers, the most affluent segment of society there's probably ever been, account for they're basically 53 to 72 now. Um, and they account for half of the UK's 11 trillion pounds in wealth. Right? Half of them are still economically active. And importantly for many people in this room, they are also property owners. But they're also property owners who are in the process of upsizing or downsizing. They're the most active participants in the property market in terms of transactions, buying and selling property is going to give you nice big fees. And I love this stat. 55 to 75 year old power users of their phones look at them an average of 60 times a day. I'm sure there's a few of us in that room, I'm one of those. That works out 22,000 times a year that they are glued to their phone. This is a huge opportunity for people. And then the graph here is just, of course, just looking at anything under 54, so almost 100% penetration of the internet, and then these lines are all kind of coming up at the other, the other side. So this segment of population is not one that should be ignored through digital channels. In fact, it should be embraced and should be specifically targeted. Because your prime customers are out there doing digital things. And you need to find as many ways as you possibly can to bring them into your world, whether it's through your, your marketing uh, efforts or through your communication channels that you make available to them um, and all the other things that you, that you, that you do. I was going to finish off with this slide. And Fine and Country are a, are a client of ours, and we've worked with them for um, coming up for two years now. And you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with Fine and Country. They tend to deal with the high end uh, property. There's probably around 200 plus, more than, well, there are more than 200 plus uh, offices around the UK. Live chat Yomdal was introduced in mid 2016, as indeed was um, an instant online valuation tool. Prior to that, Fine and Country only had a web form online. So just to make a point about cannibalization or extra opportunity, and this is really, really important, because there's no point just stealing from Peter to pay Paul. There's no point from adopting one thing and taking it away from the other. You need to have net more going through. So in 2017 versus 2016, even though um, they had um, uh, introduced uh, instant online valuation and live chat, uh, the web form yes, please contact me for a valuation, saw a net increase of I think it's around like 1.2% in total. Given that the website traffic had not changed significantly, um, that was fine. The instant online valuation for, uh, tool they put in place brought them another 1,100 sales valuation opportunities of varying degrees of um, usefulness. Some of them very flaky, obviously. Um, but another 1,100, so it dwarfed the web forms. And Yomdal, when I, mean, I was sitting down with um, David Lindley, the CEO, in February, just before the Fine and Country conference, and we reviewed all of the data from 2017, 
and we saw this figure of 1,735 sales valuation requests. That's aside from all of the other leads that we had generated for them, there's value obviously in buyers and all kinds of other things. We realized that Yomdal had generated 48% of all of the sales valuation opportunities that were captured on the Fine and Country website. And then taking it a little bit further again, that 48%, that 1,735 business opportunities, which if you imagine the fee for Fine and Country is very high, so that's a potential pipeline, you know, idealistic pipeline, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, that 48% of leads came from, if you just look at their UK traffic, about 1.3% of their website visitors. It's a very targeted deployment. A very, very, very small subsection of the visitors that came onto the website generated almost half of their sales valuation opportunities. Um, and these, these aren't just any the other leads. They're very well qualified and they convert typically at a um, higher level than, um, than some of the others. So on that, I can talk a lot more, but on that, I'm going to finish, actually. Um, but before I give the stage, I don't know if there's any questions um, anyone would like to ask. Silence is golden. Yes? How many people, Andy, do you have actually answering those large chat rooms? Okay, so um, the Yondel business is about 60% property, and the rest is other, other sectors, fin the financial sector, for example, uh, automotive, travel, various others. Um, the way we're structured is, uh, we make no secret of this, is that um, in Billingshurst in Sussex is our headquarters, and we currently have a staff of about 18 people there, of which half of them are operational staff. And that, that Billingshurst office is staffed now 24-7, five days a week, and from 8 a.m. till midnight Saturday, Sundays. And they're the senior supervisors, and the trainers, and the client operational contacts. The actual operators themselves are located in two state-of-the-art um, delivery centers uh, based in the Philippines. And there's about 100 of them there currently, but those are increasing all of the time. Um, it's important to stress, as we are now only tick tock, tick tock, 10 days away from GDPR, which I'm sure is a subject and that many of you have had to grapple with in this room. And we have been um, devoting an awful lot of attention to the whole <coughs> data protection, privacy, security, all of these kinds of things since back end of last year, so quite a long time, to ensure that all of our systems and processes and settings and everything is as compliant as we can possibly be. Um, so we're quite confident that we are where we, where, where, where we need to be. But, um, but essentially the team is, is, is um, we have plenty of room for expansion. Uh, we will be looking for a third um, centre pretty soon. We've also recently established Yomdal in New Zealand and Australia, um, which is just beginning to kick off now. Yes? How much do you charge? Oh, three. <laughs> um, it varies depending on, depending on the type of business um, and the volume of traffic that you have coming through and what's, what the definition of success needs to look like. For us, it's actually about, um, you know, we either work on a per lead model, which normally suits the smaller volume traffic businesses, or a per chat model, which, which um, suits um, large volume businesses. And the, the starting price on per chat is £3.15. Uh, we typically convert one in three people to an opportunity. 35% is the average conversion rate across everything, so that's why we get such a large result from such a small subset of people. Um, but at the end of the day, the most important thing is to ensure that, is that, is that we understand what success looks like that we work as a close partner. As our relationships with clients mature, um, we tend to be brought in, we lift up the bonnet, we work together, we look at what's firing right, what's not firing right. We work with our partners like Fountain, for example, to form a unified front, drive demand, look at opportunities for conversion, um, and then what else can be done to help the process through. So we have a number of other services where we take people from chat to voice, for example, straight away, straight through to the sales team. Um, there's an SMS um, service that goes over the top. There's a whole range of different, different, different things. But while the cost is important, the most important thing is the return on investment. And we try to work very hard with our clients to understand what that return on investment is. And in most cases, it's significant. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? I'm sure. Yes. Can we 
we give you uh, brand voice guidelines? Yes, you can. Every engagement follows a set of very clear processes, um, and uh, any brand, you know, we are we are your opportunity. We are you only have one opportunity to make a good first impression, and if you're doing it via chat, it's doing it via us. That's a huge responsibility. So we work very closely with you to ensure that the tone of voice is, is spot on. I'm an ex-journalist and publisher, and quality of language and engagement is really, really important. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Um, obviously, we'll be here. So I think I might have overrun a little bit. I apologise for that. Um, but um, uh, thank you for your time, and there's Google to follow. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs>